discussion uh, about the impact of coronavirus uh, on our communities here and this morning we have once again Liz Saville Roberts, Member of Parliament uh, and also Mared Gwyn, Mared from Llenbedrog and is an expert on communication and work. Usually in, in Brussels we'll get on to that in a minute but um, before we talk to you Mared, uh, Liz when we've spoken to you in previous uh, editions of this podcast, you've been at home in Nevin. You're clearly not at home now. Where are you? I'm a long way from Nevin. Uh, I am between doing question time in London last night and, and travelling home. And I took the opportunity to visit my, my father and his partner who live in, in Birmingham. Had a cup of tea perched on their garden wall while they were outside. And I am somewhere in Birmingham. On, on, on the way back. Yeah, and, and you, you had a, a good question time last night. Well, question time was very interesting. Of course, we were, as expected, we were talking about the Black Lives Matter that's arisen since the, the death of George Floyd. That's brought on, I think, probably what will be a societal changing discussion on how we approach our history. At UK level, it's also brought on exactly the same discussion about how we approach that at a Welsh level. Um, as I left, as I fetched my car from the car park in Westminster, the statue of Churchill was boarded up and they're expecting protests this weekend. And frankly, I mean, as somebody who was born and raised in Eltham, and I remember the murder of Stephen Lawrence, mm. and the sense that that changed things at its time, it never changed enough. Mm. And this is a discussion that we, we really need to have. History is, is made in the present, what we look back upon and what we choose to celebrate. And we're in a very interesting time, shifting away from celebrating the powerful, the white male, the effect of empire. And we're beginning to, see, you know, to really appreciate everybody's histories and the fact that those are not always tidy and they're not always nice in relation to each other. So I think one of the things that we shall see coming out of this. Yeah, and, and you know, we've not had much of that education in the past um, through the formal education system. Uh, we don't really know much of our own history and the history of uh, black ethnic and minority communities here in Wales. And it can be difficult for us and we've got to face up uh, to that history and, and realise the part that we've played in, in very muggy past sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, and I understand that they were you know, going back two centuries ago. There were slave ships were built in Portelli, mm. and we we need to know that some of our you know our wealth in Britain has been built on the back of terrible suffering. Yeah, yeah. and to be honest about that. Yes. So we have you, uh, Liz, um, somewhere uh, in a car in Birmingham at the moment. Uh, and as I uh, said earlier, we've got Mared Gwyn in Llampedrog, but you're not usually in Llampedrog, are you, Mared? No, that's right. So usually I would be in Brussels. Um, I've been living and working in Brussels now for three years. Um, I initially went out to do a, a traineeship at the European Commission, and I was at that time based in Luxembourg. And then since then, I've moved to Brussels and I work in public affairs and communications. Um, so our agency is quite well known in the in the Brussels bubble as we call it and I'm very lucky to have the opportunity to work co quite closely with the institutions, um, the commission and, and the parliament as well. Sometimes in Brussels from time to time to, in Strasbourg as well. Right, and, and of course we've seen you um, several times on the media commenting on, on politics. Uh, so you're well placed uh, to discuss uh, the coronavirus and how the response of other countries across the European Union to the, the crisis at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now thinking about that, uh, the, the crisis that we're uh, living in the middle of it now, the big story this week I think would be that um, Professor Ferguson said that had we locked down maybe a week earlier uh, that we'd have seen um, far less deaths. Um, uh, now th there is a, a chance that we look back and uh, looking in hindsight, 
But is, is that the case, Liz? Do you think that that is a fair criticism, that it is a hindsight, or did we know uh, soon enough that we were facing a pandemic and someone should have uh, acted earlier? The first thing to say is that what we know about this disease is, is very recent. I'm only talking about it being aware to science for seven months now. Um, and I am cautious of, of jumping to make, make political statements. Um, having said that, I hope that we have an inquiry as soon as possible. And I understand a lot of sufferers' families have asked for that because we need that in the first instance to make sure that we're learning lessons in case there is a second peak. There will be a more thorough inquiry after that, I know, but we need to, to get lessons learned quickly. But I must say that in the weeks before the 23rd of March, um, weeks of March, it was an open secret in Westminster. MPs talk to each other a lot, as you can imagine. You know, people in the government talk to people who are not in the government. Um, and I remember this message, look, there's going to be a lockdown. If you want to get back to your constituency, you need to go now. And that was between certainly a good week before the 23rd. So there is a question there. And of course, there is this question now that we, possibly thousands more people have died than might have happened if the lockdown had occurred earlier. Mm. I think the other major issue when we come to looking at this, you know, to reviewing this, is the, the government's awareness of the role of uh, social care and the, the way it was assumed that social care would be all right. Mm. We know now that social care was not all right and it remains you know, that we have seen thousands of people who... <sighs> We will have to see whether the way that was handled was was negligent or not. Yeah, because there's a there's a concern that maybe up to half of the deaths are in care homes, and I think that's a, a statistic that we found in other countries. Certainly, uh, in Italy, they found between forty and fifty percent of deaths in care homes. Uh, and thinking about Italy, you know, we saw how Italy went into lockdown lockdown but three weeks before we did um certainly in wuhan in china they went into lockdown far earlier because the, the pandemic broke out in china or at least that's our understanding but Marad, um thinking about italy and the response of other countries do you think that um we learned did we learn from the other countries experience who had this pandemic before us and other best practices elsewhere which we might learn from looking forward I think the pandemic certainly caught most European governments off guard. Mm. Um, there was no real sense of preparedness, I would say, anywhere. Having said that, I think, um, as Liz said, it might not be the most useful exercise with hindsight to look back at what could have been done differently. But I do think looking at some of the good practices that were put in place in some countries that there were certainly things that could have been done better. So if we think of, we usually don't look to, towards Eastern Europe or Central Europe for good practices. Um, we think of um, the more Western countries as having the more sophisticated and advanced healthcare services and so on. But it is true that some of the smaller countries, um, Austria, Slovakia, Portugal, Greece, took early um, and very precise steps to tackle the, the virus. Um, Slovakia is one example that actually locked down to a degree before any deaths have been registered in the country. Mm. And that certainly helped um, and has managed to keep uh, the virus transmission levels under control in those countries. I think it's also fair to say that um, the European Union itself was caught off guard. Um, there was criticism, obviously, at the beginning. There was a lack of a coordinated response ac across the continent. And there were um, complaints, certainly from those countries worst hit, that there was not enough solidarity shown by European countries, not enough um, coordination. We, we did see some examples of patients being moved across the borders from France, some um, badly hit areas in France into Germany, where there was more capacity to treat some of the patients. So certainly the, the principle of freedom of movement um, helped in that regard. There, was, there were always uh, also attempts to share essential supplies and so on. But the criticism has been that the European Union hasn't acted quick enough. Although um, 
recently, of course, they have um, announced quite an ambitious support package of 750 billion euros. Um, and about two thirds of that is hopefully going to be in the form of grants. This is something we haven't seen before in the history of the European Union, something that is quite unprecedented in the sense that it is in the form of grants. It is countries um, reaching out a helping hand to other countries that have been badly hit by the virus. Um, but there is a sense that that's absolutely necessary and essential at this point if the European Union is to continue, that there needs to be a strong sense of solidarity between the nations. Um, so the hope is that together they will be able to rebuild back better. And there's also a strong push from the European Union as well in terms of rebuilding back in line with the principles of the European Green Deal. So make sure that the, the recovery is a green one that is still... Um, um, kind of respecting the principles of climate change and the changes that need to be done to make our societies more sustainable um, and to save save the planet as well. So there are ambitions, there's a long way to go and certainly the, the virus has thrown some of those, the, those plans into disarray. But the hope is that the economic, economic recovery will be a, a, green, a green one. So, so initially you, you mentioned that there, there's, there was some criticism in the initial stages at least of lack of cooperation but uh, what what you talked about there suggests that there's uh, some forward planning now and looking at how they're going to come out of this uh, and the economic impact that each country is probably suffering at the moment uh, liz we saw statistics uh, yesterday and statistics coming out today certainly about uh, the hits that the uk's gdp has had um in the last month uh, do you get a sense that the UK government and the Welsh government, um, either separately or working together, are, are planning um, on how to come out of this and whether we're going to see a different form of community, society and government uh, uh, on the other side of this pandemic? What, we, what, what is concerning me at present, talking to people in the constituency, businesses in the constituency, is our extreme dependency with businesses in the hospitality and tourism sector on the furlough scheme. Um, but that's wider than that. We know now that something like 74% of businesses in Wales, and that's the highest percentage of the four UK nations, are, are making use of the furlough scheme. Mm. Now that's beginning to, to gear down in August. Wow. Businesses are required to pay um, pensions and national insurance. And it will gear down properly in October. Now, particularly for, particularly for Wales, but also for areas across the UK that are really dependent upon, upon tourism and hospitality, uh, they're facing what we're calling the three winter scenario. Now, I think it's brought, it's brought it home to me. I think it's brought it home to many other people, although it's quite delightful to have our communities as quiet as they are. We know that you know, you can see this is how money comes into the area. We really need an economic stimulus package. And I hope that the Welsh government and, and, and the UK government will work together in this respect, because otherwise we're going to see particular areas that are going to have particular effects, are really going to suffer particular effects. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that France is maintaining their... Um, job protection scheme they're talking about maintaining two years now that compares with Rishi Sunak's plan to October and of course I mean to be fair on Welsh government all their policies are dependent on what Rishi Sunak decides to do in relation to that job protection scheme because as soon as that's gone then the economy that depends upon that has nothing to hold it up um, it's also interesting, of course, the Treasury has made sure that Wales can only borrow a tiny amount compared to what could possibly be useful in this respect. If I could just take the step back, though, I mean, these obvious questions, the fact that Welsh government's policies are so dependent on what is being done in West Africa, this is growing an interest in independence in Wales. We've just seen a YouGov poll. The people who are supporting independence has gone up by 4%. That's the other debate in the Build Back Better, as do we really want to be in this arrangement which is showing that 
the disadvantaged areas of Britain are suffering unduly? And was that uh, str- These are the questions we're going to be asking ourselves. Yeah, the, the, and we're living in interesting times in, the, in that respect. There's more awareness of, uh, of the sense of uh, developing a civic body here in Wales, which represents the views of, of Wales. Um, but you mentioned one, uh, one phrase there, the build back better, uh, Liz. Um, it certainly seems that from Rishi Sunak and the UK government's point of view, and, and the fact that the Welsh government are so tied to what the UK government is doing, that there's, there's nothing much beyond the very short term that we know about, while uh, Marad referred to a, a longer term vision within countries across the European Union. That brings us neatly, I think, to, to that element of communication, communicating that message, uh, that vision and our plans. Um, that, that's certainly been a, a criticism here, um, that the information hasn't been communicated clearly to people, um, and there's been some criticism of, of the way that Boris Johnson has avoided um, uh, channels and TV programmes. Marad, thinking about the way that you communicate, would you say that there's been a weakness uh, within Wales or in the UK, or are there strengths that we can learn from elsewhere? Well, I think it's been a communication challenge like no other. It's like nothing we've seen in recent memory. Because the challenge is that these messages are, in a sense, universal. Everyone is affected by the situation and everyone has to change their behaviour when when governments introduce measures such as these. Um, I think, in a sense, we've seen good practices um, across um, Europe. We've seen some good practices at the UK and, and Wales level. There was, a, you know, there was an effort to have daily briefings, to have very consistent um, um, briefings not only from government ministers but also from the scientific experts and the medical um, experts as well and um, that's obviously essential in terms of credibility for governments at this point um, but I think what the this this unprecedented situation and, and the pandemic has shown is that previous habits in terms of government communications through the media um, were completely unacceptable um, boycotting certain channels for example, um, secret briefings leaked out um, to specific media sources, um, big announcements being made and paywall protected articles that most of the population were not able to access. These kind of things have had to go out the window because it's absolutely not, not acceptable in, in such times. Um, I think another thing obviously is that um, governments need to be completely transparent um, it was something that we've seen. We're getting daily updates in terms of the data at a, at a Welsh level, at, a, at an UK level as well. And that's something that's been completely instrumental in keeping the citizens and the population informed. Um, but I do think there have been some um, setbacks as well. We've seen recently that there's increasing pressure on the Welsh government to reveal information about their correspondence with the UK government in terms of the testing scheme with the Roche company from Switzerland. These are the kind of things that, that citizens have come to expect. It's um, completely transparent communications. Um, we saw it in Asia um, at the, the early stages of the pandemic. And we've seen horrific examples recently from Latin America as well in terms of Brazil now stopping and refusing to, to release data on the number of cases and the number of deaths in the country and that was a decision from Bolsonaro's government over there. Um, these are things that po- the population deserves to know and needs to understand in order to, to understand the process in terms of um, battling the public health crisis but also transitioning the economy as Liz um, mentioned there. So I think there have been examples of good practices the, gov- the government at UK and Welsh level have been able to adapt but also some things that I think could prob- probably have been done better as well. Mm-hmm. And, and looking at um, communication strategies and, and the tools that we have available, um, Liz I know we've got a, a very weak national media in Wales while there's um, overpowering London media um, and there has certainly been some criticism that when Lin- uh, when Boris Johnson has been making announcements he's been making them as as a UK Prime Minister but the, the, what he was announcing was 
simply just for, for England and not for Wales. Do you think that's been a problem in Wales and how can we get over that uh, um, weak um, national media in Wales? I think it's, it's very interesting that it has been, um, of course, you know, the nature of um, the UK wide press, that anything that Boris Johnson, Prime Minister of the UK, says is amplified loudly. Um, he doesn't like to think of himself as Prime Minister of England, but in most of these announcements he's been making in recent weeks, that's been exactly what he has been. I think one of the really interesting things, and, um, and, and I know that the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, was actually anxious on some of his own policies that he wouldn't be able to convey them within Wales, uh, and that that has an effect on some of the policies that have been, been announced. My experience actually has been that people in Wales know very well what affects them, and they, they understand that, they may not agree with it, because it affects them as per persons as individuals. That sense of the border be being between England and Wales has, is much stronger now than it was previously. Our problem has been in, in our constituency is people coming from England and not appreciating, understanding that the rules were different in Wales and the, and the poor police having to deal with that has been quite hard. But I think actually this is a very interesting challenge for, for Labour in government because on the one hand they are trying to shore up their um, unionist credentials, what they're most comfortable with, but on the other hand they actually have real, real power in Wales and whether they've used that to best effect. At the same time, the people of Wales really get the fact that they live in a different country now to that of England. And again, this is one of the other things that we have potential for build back better over. We'll see how that works out as well. Yeah, and, and of course, that's the one thing that this pandemic, politically here in Wales, has brought back is the realization that devolution is real. It's here, and we can develop different policies in Wales to that of the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, we're, we're drawing to uh, an end with this conversation. But briefly, man, I just wanted to touch on on social media as well. Think about communication and and how we communicate. Things are, are changing quickly uh, in the communication world, and you know this this video now will be broadcast on various platforms: uh, Facebook. Um, and YouTube being two of them. What, what role has social media played uh, with us? Well, uh, as part of my work, actually, I work very closely on um, political communications on social media platforms. And um, we've seen not only with this pandemic, but in recent years with um, electoral campaigns, how, how much power actually these platforms have. This is how we digest a lot of the information. They also provide um, very intricate and sophisticated ways of actually targeting our messages to different demographic groups. So in that sense, they can be extremely powerful. What's important, of course, is to ensure that the, the information that is um, given out um, to the citizens is accurate, is true, to fight misinformation on these platforms. Of course, big tech companies also have a responsibility to ensure that um, communication on their platforms is, is accurate um, to avoid the spread of misinformation. We saw dreadful, horrific um, news being put out um, during this pandemic on, on the implication of 5G in, in the spread of the virus. Those things are obviously cause concern and so um, it's a responsibility on these platforms as well. We've seen Twitter now recently taking action to flag um, information that can potentially be misleading and even that kind of information published by world leaders if we think about the um the president of the united states so i think this is a, a process that it's still ongoing there needs to be more action and um, government uh, policy makers regulators also need to work closely with these big tech platforms to, to ensure that social media provide a safe space for, for for broadcasting this kind of information but it's certainly the future and not only your typical twitter facebook um Instagram, but new platforms as well that are becoming increasingly popular amongst the younger generations. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Marid. Um, uh, that, that's really informative then. You know, we'll be seeing how uh, this new tech develops and uh, how we can use it better to communicate with people as, as we look forward as well. Thank you, both of you, and we look forward to the uh, conversation again next week. Right.